Welcome to the next episode of Great War Story. I've called this one, One Chapter Ends. And it's about endings in a lot of ways. It's an ending for the Anzacs when they finally gave up at Gallipoli. But it's also an ending for my grandfather because he leaves the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance. And he also, eventually, will leave Egypt for France. And this photo in the background is actually a photo of what's probably a driver in an ambulance unit in Egypt. And he does look like he's kind of walking away like he's done, doesn't he? Sadly, it's not my grandfather, but I like the body language and it certainly represents what I'm talking about today. Now, before I go on, I just want to acknowledge the source of most of the images that I'm going to be using today. They come from a photo uh, depository of the National Army Museum in Waiuru in New Zealand. I believe, in fact, that the medals of my grandfather are actually held there. I think one of my family members donated them at some point. I've never actually tried to go and view them because, well, to me, they're just bits of metal and not particularly symbolic of anything. But I do have a special feeling for this museum because it's in the middle of nowhere. It seems a funny thing to say. You can see here on the map where you'll find Waiuru. It's because when I was a kid and I lived in Auckland, we used to go and visit my grandfather and Anwal in Wellington at the bottom of the North Island. And it was a long drive. And we would encounter the museum just after we finished the desert road. Seems funny to talk about a desert road in New Zealand, but in fact, New Zealand does, does have a desert because it's a desert by, well, by measuring the amount of annual rainfall. It's a high tundra, really. And when you came out of that long, windy road, the first little settlement you'd come to would be Waiuru, and that's where the National Army Museum is. It's because they have quite big military training facilities in the area, because it's cold, it's high, it's wasteland. What better place to train soldiers? So this is my acknowledgement for the images. They come from the National Army Museum in Waiuru. So we've talked about Gallipoli in a previous episode and how my grandfather almost landed was actually on a troop ship watching things at, and was there at quite an exciting time. There was a British warship getting sunk very close to where they were. They were witnessing a battle. It was actually about the time of a major Turkish counteroffensive trying to drive the Anzacs off the beaches. And my grandfather, meanwhile, is sent back to Egypt with the horses. And there were there were hundreds and hundreds of horses because all of the mounted battalions and mounted units had to leave their horses behind because for most of them at least there was no use for horses so he was doing important work but not famous work just looking after the horses looking after their health looking making sure they were fed keeping them cleaned and groomed and all of those kind of things and what is often forgotten in war and in the military of course is that it's not just about the fighting units. There's always a lot of people who are doing things like this, keeping the men fed, bringing the ammunition up, all of those kind of things. And there is a book, and I have a copy of it, and I'll probably come back and make use of it in a future episode. The book is called Salute to Service, and it is a book about the New Zealand ASC, the Army Service Corps, those guys who were behind the logistics, the guys who made it possible for others to fight. So while it might not have been very fancy, it was important and needed work that my grandfather was doing back in Egypt, helping look after the horses. Meanwhile, at Gallipoli, however, this is what the troops were living through. You can see the appalling conditions. They were there from April to December. They had hard fighting in April and May. Things settled down somewhat. They tried a massive new offensive in August, which was a disaster, and many men were killed. And they never did get off the beaches. They 
dug into the sandy, scrub-covered soil. They suffered through snow. They suffered through the summer months with horrible flies. Dysentery was a terrible problem. There was no source of fresh water, so any water they had to drink had to be brought in by ship. Uh, they were constantly shelled. It was a miserable existence. And throughout it all, there was a steady flow of wounded coming back on hospital ships. And on the left, you can see two male ambulance drivers along with a female ambulance driver. I actually have quite a lot to say about her that will take more than one episode, but I'm saving that for a later date. You can see the ambulances parked next to the troop ship in the top photo. And in the bottom photo in Alexandria Harbour, there are three hospital ships alongside each other. These photos again show this flow of wounded returning from Gallipoli. You can see a hospital ship is against the dock with its gangplank down and wounded men are getting off. You can see one of them being carried in a stretcher, another one with a badly damaged foot being helped off by two other men. It was, it was bad. And here we have from a publication that was a weekly publication throughout of all, of, all of World War I, mostly consisting of pictures and um, a lot of really interesting stuff about World War I throughout it. I'm lucky enough to have bought a bound set of the whole lot from 1914 all the way through to 1918. And this photo shows a hospital in Egypt of those guys, the wounded, who had been sent home from the terrible suffering at Gallipoli. And the caption says, the long room echoes with laughter and merry talk, and it is hard to realize that one is in the presence of so much suffering, in the presence of men who have risked their all for an ideal, who have looked terrible death full in the face in Gallipoli. This photograph is a happy impression of a ward at Luna Park Hospital, Cairo. The beds are made from date stalks and palm leaves. So, well, it's still got a bit of the rah-rah patriotism. It's also got a full acknowledgement about just how miserable things were. And of course, it wasn't just wounded. There were many deaths. And when I was going through the photo albums of the National Army Museum, I found a couple that were truly horrific that I absolutely cannot show you. This photo is a burial detail. You can see the guy on the left has some kind of pickaxe or something. You can see the guys in the background are busy digging. And that whole area that I've blotted out is dead bodies. It was a quite disturbing image to look at. All of those dead who are waiting to be buried. And we have a new source that I haven't quoted before, although I, um, I know I'll be citing him again in future, Herbert Hart. He was with the, um, that first convoy that brought my grandfather to Egypt, and he was at Gallipoli. And here's what he had to write about December the 13th, 1915. Fatigue parties and others who returned from the beach tell the most weird stories about picks, shovels, engines, piping, iron, etc., being towed out to sea and jettisoned, about ordnance stores being open to anyone, and kerosene being tipped over huge stores of supplies. It can mean only one thing, evacuation. So all we have suffered and sacrificed here has been in vain. Now the next day it was officially confirmed to the officers, but they were told they weren't allowed to tell the men yet. Um, and here we have a photo, a very rare photo. You get lots of photos of the men getting ready to land, lots of photos of the initial attacks, very few photos out there of what it was like towards the end and the troops as they were leaving. This photo shows troops in December of 1915 smashing up, well, I think in this case it's biscuit tins, basically destroying as much as they can so when they go they will not be leaving anything for the Turks. And of course, when they leave, they're not taking everybody with them. 
they left a lot of dead. This is a photo of um, a number of graves at Gallipoli. And here we have Herbert Hart again on December the 15th. I was able to disclose that it was expected that the remainder of the battalion would embark on Friday and Saturday nights. The men view very unkindly the thought of clearing out. It jars very heavily upon one. Hundreds have volunteered to stay and fight it out, or to stay as a covering party to sacrifice their lives if required to get even with the enemy and save their pals. We do not like admitting it is a failure. One man said to me, Hell, sir, I hope our poor pals who lie all around us sleep soundly and do not stir in discontent as we go filing away from them forever. Now, people who come from countries like America or England or, well, France, etc. We're used to having war memorials and we know that a lot of men died, but we also know that they fought for victory. They succeeded. Yes, many men died, many men paid the price, but at least they accomplished something. I've sometimes wondered about German war memorials. Like, lots of men died fighting for Germany. But they were giving their lives in a futile effort. No matter how many sacrifices they made, how many deaths that, that occurred, they lost. How much stronger must be the question for countries like that when they ask, what does it all mean? Well, here, of course, in the case of the Gallipoli campaign for all of those men who were there, they had the same kind of questions to ask. We were here from April to December. We lost so many friends. They're dead. They're never coming back. We gave so much. And what was it all for? Was it for nothing? Now, when I was at Gallipoli at Anzac Cove, they had this monument erected at the beach. And, well, it's rather nice. I'm going to read it out for you. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mammoths. To us, where they lie side by side, here in this country of ours, you, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. And it's reputed to have been said by Ataturk in the 1930s. Now, I know for history purists, they will say that you can only really say this quote is attributed to Ataturk, that there's reason to doubt whether he ever said it or not, but let's not worry about that. Turkish authorities felt it was appropriate to put this quote there exactly where the Anzacs landed, where those New Zealand boys landed, and it is a beautiful sentiment of peace and forgiveness for all of those boys, both Turkish and British and New Zealand and French and all the others who died in this place. If you thought the story was bad, it gets worse. Today, the artillery horses were shot. One dispatch rider who gallops along the beach daily from Chalik Dare to Walker's Ridge went into hysterics when he was informed that his horse which had been wounded under him three times, had to be destroyed in that manner. But it was time to go, and they couldn't give the Turks a warning. If they started to obviously load those artillery horses and other things, it would let the Turks know that the evacuation was underway, and they would come storming down from the heights, and then it would be an utter disaster. Everything had to be done in secrecy. This is perhaps the most famous picture, because these are the famous drip rifles. It was a mechanism of dripping water attached to a rifle trigger, so that even after the troops had all gone, there would still be an occasional um, rifle going off to fool the Turks into thinking that there were still men 
manning the trenches. And it was a grim toll for a futile endeavor. Now, these numbers are controversial and subject to dispute, but I'm not going to worry about that for now. The number that I'm using is 188,000 Allied casualties. Now, you do remember that casualties doesn't mean dead. That means dead and wounded. And I think in this case, it even includes missing and prisoners. And out of those 188,000 casualties, 57,000 dead. And all of these graves you see there were left behind at Gallipoli. Now, the New Zealand contingent was only a small portion. There were many Indians, there were French, there were plenty of English regiments represented in the Aussies, of course, as well. But they suffered badly. I think those 2,800 represents about a sixth of the total force that was deployed. It's pretty bad. And both of these are New Zealand graves. Now, the one on the left was a later one after the war when men came back to refurbish the cemetery. But you may recognize that name. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas, New Zealand Medical Corps, who died 28th of August 1915, age 50. He was the commanding officer of the New Zealand Field Ambulance, and I've quoted quite a number of his letters in previous episodes. He did not make it alive through the Gallipoli campaign. And I wasn't actually able to identify what harbour this photo came from, but it seemed appropriate to represent the evacuation. They needed a vast amount of shipping because they had to get them off within one or two days. A vast accumulation, a magnificent logistical exercise in organising everything and getting them all away safely and getting them back to Egypt. And when they got back to Egypt, they must have been shell-shocked. You imagine the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And then imagine that thing was extended from April to December. You hadn't just lost one friend, you'd lost multiple friends. You'd seen many men die. You had suffered physical deprivation. And, well, it was just horrific. And in the end, it was all for nothing. You had to leave your boys behind, your fallen friends and comrades, that is, and return to Egypt. I guess they did their best. And this photo actually shows preparation for the New Year's Day party in, 19, um, in 1916. But when I see this picture, I can't help thinking of a song from the musical Les Miserables, Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, Where My Friends Will Drink No More. You think of all of the boys who went, who didn't come home, and all of those empty chairs where they should have been sitting. Now, to bring it back to what I'm always interested, of course, is my grandfather's story. And my grandfather's story gets touched by this evacuation because all these shattered units have to be reorganized, and they have to decide what are the New Zealanders going to do now. And so in early 1916, there is a large reorganization of forces. The mounted units will reclaim their horses, and they will remain in the Middle East and take part in the campaigns against the Ottoman Empire. The infantry units will be sent to France. They will go on troop ships to Marseille and by train up to the Western Front. Now, if my grandfather had remained with the mounted field ambulance, he would have remained in the Middle East. But at this time, he is transferred out of the mounted field ambulance and sent back to the Army Service Corps. If you remember, he was in the Army Service Corps attached to the ambulance. Now he is returned back to his original force. And... Um, this is the only time in any of the Mounted Field Ambulance diaries that my grandfather's name actually appears. You can bet that I scoured them trying to look for any reference to him, and it's right at the end. Now, I have to say, 
I had quite a lot of trouble deciphering that first word. I don't think it says transference, but I'm not quite sure what it is. But it's definitely something about a transfer because they are being sent back from the ASC attached. 5 slash 77, that's the service number of my grandfather. Now it's not Dr. Fowler. DR is driver. Remember a private who looks after horses? Driver Fowler RB is sent to number one company ASC. And also driver McEwen J to number three company ASC. Now where did he go after he left the field ambulance and what was he doing? Well, we return to my grandfather's military file, which is sadly lacking in detail. There is exactly one clue about what's happening. So we know that he was in the ASC from the start attached to the mounted field ambulance. And we have plenty of evidence about what he was doing in 1917 and 1918. He was with the New Zealand Machine Gun Corps. What was he doing in between? We have exactly one piece of evidence and it consists of two words, field bakery, crossed out. Now, when I first noticed this on the military file, I asked my mother, who is the, you know, the daughter of the soldier, I asked all the other relatives, do you ever remember hearing anything about granddad being in the field bakery? And the universal answer is no, never heard of it anywhere. But he had to have been doing something between when he was with the ambulance and when he joined the machine gunners. And that is the only time we can say that that's when he was. Sadly, as I said, the military file actually doesn't make any other reference to the field bakery, but that's one of the jobs that the ASC soldiers would have been doing. So it's logical. It's kind of strange that his service through all of 1916 um, is limited to a record of two words. Now, trying to puzzle out this mystery, I had one possible clue to help me. The fact that when Grandad was transferred out, there was one other man who was sent at the same time. So I thought on a hunch I would look up his military file and see what I could find. And you see here he was ASC attached mounted field ambulance, exactly the same job my grandfather was doing. But you also see there in red field bakery. Now, even though they were being sent to different companies, they were both being sent to the field bakery. Now, my grandfather, as far as I know, had no experience in baking or cooking or being a chef or anything like that. So why would he be sent to the field bakery? But when you look at McEwen's military file, you see what it says next to qualification? He is a qualified baker. And when you look elsewhere in his military file for what was he doing before he joined the army? You can see there that actually he was a baker in civilian life. So it's a clue. It's hard to say exactly what it means, but here's my theory. Grandad did not want to stay in the Middle East, but he didn't quite know how to organize to get out. So he would be sent to France with those troops. And somehow or other, he was chatting with this guy, James McEwen. And James McEwen, who was a qualified baker, had worked an angle because he wanted to go to France as well, that the bakery troops needed men. So he says to Grandad, come along with me, stick with me, I'll see you right. And so it was James McEwen who was actually responsible for helping Grandad transfer. Now, why would Grandad have wanted to transfer? Well, again, it's guesswork on my part, but this is what I wonder. I think there was a young lady in London that he was already thinking about. Now that is my grandmother. He is going to marry her eventually. And my uncle Duncan's family history says that he only reconnected with her when he was wounded in France and sent back to England to recuperate. I wonder if he was already thinking of her. Perhaps they were already writing to each other. Or perhaps it was just a, a dream in his mind and well, I like the idea that that's the reason why he was so keen to not remain in the Middle East with the troops there, but rather to um, 
to get to France and the, the Western Front instead. So in early 1916, he got on a troop ship with other members of the ASC and went all the way across the Mediterranean, threatened by German U-boats, by the way, and eventually disembarked in Europe at the French port of Marseille. And it was goodbye to Alexandria and the end of a chapter, the end of the chapter of the Gallipoli campaign, but also the end of my grandfather's time in the Middle East and his time with the mounted field ambulance. And that's all I have for you today.